Hey everyone, I'm Simone, and tonight on Signal, at least one U.S. Marine is dead and five is still missing after a military aircraft collision off the coast of Japan. Plus, we step into a modern day library of Alexandria and meet the people who made it their mission to archive the entire internet. And as George H.W. Bush arrives at the Bush Presidential Library, Esquire's editor in chief analyzes a different part of his legacy his signature sock collection. But first, guys, the Dow rebounded after a nearly 800 point plunge earlier today, closing mostly flat. CNBC's Seema Modi has been following this all day. Seema, a very dramatic day on Wall Street. What led to the market rebound? Yeah, it was really a remarkable comeback, Simone. On a day where investors are becoming really concerned about this trade war going down between the United States and China, uh, that G20 meeting where Xi and Trump both agreed to that 90-day truce, there's a lot of concern that this truce lacked substance and that investors are not really convinced that this deal will, in fact, come together. The reason the market came back, there was some talk that the Federal Reserve, so our central bank, may not raise rates as fast as initially expected. So then we saw this dramatic turnaround in the market. But I can tell you that trade concerns still front and center. Okay, so first, let's take, take a step back here and kind of look at what happened uh, with today's intraday drop. Mm -hmm. So the CFO of Chinese tech company Huawei was arrested right. in Canada for allegedly violating U.S. sanctions on Iran. What kind of ongoing impact could that have on these trade tensions with China? Yeah, so Meng Wanzhou is the CFO of Huawei. This is a major Chinese tech firm. It's one of the top smartphone makers in the world. And she was detained on possible violation of U.S. sanctions. The context here is that Huawei has been uh, in the crosshairs for years because of its alleged ties to the Chinese government and Chinese intelligence officials. What is notable, though, is the timing. She was arrested the same day that Donald Trump and the Chinese President Xi Jinping met in Argentina at that G20. Summit. So it certainly comes at a politically sensitive, sensitive moment. And it, the concern is that this specific event will derail the U.S.-China trade negotiations, which are currently underway. The hope, again, is to get some type of deal on the table in 90 days. All right. We'll be following this more, and we'll check in with you guys probably in the near future to see how it all shakes out. Sounds Seema, good. thank you. Thanks. All right. OPEC, a.k.a. the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, holds a twice yearly gathering with the biggest players in oil. And today talks were going on in Vienna. See, members have agreed to cut production, but haven't decided by how much. Those details may come out after OPEC's talks with other oil producing nations, including Russia, tomorrow. Now, remember, if they cut production, fewer barrels, oil prices go up. When there's a surplus of oil, prices come down. So what's at stake here in the U.S.? Our friend Von Hilliard has all the details. Hello, Simone. We're having the conversation here in D.C., but it should be the conversation that's taking place all across the United States and the world. It's a conversation about the price of oil right now and the amount of oil that is available on the global market. The price of oil has dropped over the last several days, and we're having that conversation because of OPEC. This is a 15-member nation organization, which the United States is not a part of, but it's going to have a direct impact here at home. I want to show you President Donald Trump just on Wednesday weighed in with, hopefully OPEC will be keeping oil flows as is, not restricted. The president wants to keep the price of oil low so that the price of your gasoline for your car, the price of airline tickets, the price of shipping, manufacturing, all stays low, and he is particularly trying to put pressure on Saudi Arabia, which is the major member nation in OPEC. But the reality is the other member nations of OPEC are putting pressure on Saudi Arabia to cut production because there is presently an oversupply of oil. And when those prices are low, those countries which are economically dependent on the price of oil are not able to sustain robust economies. So ultimately, the question is, will President Trump in the United United States, despite not being OPEC members, get their way? And what will be the impact of production cuts on the global oil market? Vaughn, thank you. So if you grew up with the internet, you probably assume two things. One, that you can find everything online. And two, that once something's there, it's really hard to get off. 
Okay, turns out both those things aren't exactly true. There's plenty missing, including history that probably should be preserved forever. And there's this San Francisco-based nonprofit that's trying to make that happen. So Dasha Burns spent the day with them to find out what it looks like when your job is to preserve literally everything. So I'm in a church, an old church, surrounded by old music and old games and old movies. But this story is actually about the future, the future of how we access information. So this sound has been digitized. Yes, and a lot of the uh, music that we've been digitizing just hasn't been on the internet ever. This former church is now home to a nonprofit called the Internet Archive. They want to be a digital library for everything, like everything, everything. The idea is to build the Library of Alexandria version two. Can we make it so that all the published works of humankind be accessible to anybody? Imagine, anything you want to know, all in one place. Before the internet, it was kind of a crazy thought. But back in the third century, it actually did exist. The Library of Alexandria was amazing in that it was the collection of what the Greeks, the Romans, the Hittites, the Hebrews all had to say, and it was in one place. Brewster and his team want to resurrect the library, but in a way more suited for the 21st century. It's a tough call to try to one-up the Greeks. <laughs> I mean, the internet makes it so that no matter where you are, you can get access. But can we make it so that all of the books, music, video is available? The answer is yes, technically, but we haven't gotten there yet. But is having a permanent record of everything really a good thing? What happens when, you know, I want to run for office in 30 years, but I've got old blogs or Twitter feeds that I'd rather not be part of my campaign? Whoever's going to be president in, in 24 years, we have her high school blog. And so, yes, it's, it's going to be kind of important to make sure that you don't put every thought you've ever had up on the internet. It's a little ironic though. For those of us who grew up with the internet, it sort of feels like everything that's ever been is there. Well, that's not really true. While we're worrying about getting things off the internet, there's actually a ton of stuff that never made it on. This is a diary from 1918 to 1922. Wow. Of a Russian general. And something like that, I mean, if you didn't digitize it, how long would that last? It would just, it would get lost with time. Yeah. If it's not digital, it's as if it doesn't exist. And the best we have to offer is not all digital. So we're shortchanging a generation right now. It's an interesting challenge. How do we preserve our history, our knowledge, our information in a digital world? First step, put it all online. Just all of it. Easier said than done. Every time a light blinks, is somebody either uploading something or downloading something from the Internet Archive. These are people doing things on the These Internet. Are, over a million people a day use the Internet Archive and you can see their activity. So how big is the Internet Archive? It's about 40 petabytes. Let's put it this way. Your phone is probably in the ballpark of 64 gigabytes. 15 phones, you got a terabyte. A thousand of those is a petabyte. And 40 petabytes is the Internet Archive. And of course, the hard drives in this church are just one copy. There is more spread all around the world. The Library of Alexandria is probably best known for, well, burning. If they had made another copy and put it in India or in China, we'd have the other works of Aristotle, the other plays of Euripides. We have copies here in San Francisco, but we have another copy in Richmond, California. But we also have a partial copy in Amsterdam and a partial copy in uh, Alexandria, In Egypt. Alexandria. Yes. <laughs> Today, some of the most important information never gets put on paper. It goes directly on the web. So what happens when a website goes down? or just gets updated. What about archiving the web itself? I think there's this idea that once it's on the internet, it's there forever, but that's not really no, true. Not at all. Mark Graham is the director of the Wayback Machine. It's the internet archives, well, archive of the internet. There was a study that was done at Harvard, for example, that looked at links that were used in Supreme Court opinions mm -hmm. and found that after a few years, 49% of the links no longer resolved to the content. The average life of a web page is only 100 days. That means a whole lot of information could just disappear. If you had the old edition of a book, you could look at the old edition if you wanted to. But for instance, the whitehouse.gov changes every day. And between administration, they wipe out everything before. So we try to make that 
permanently available. For lawyers, government officials, even reporters, it's become an invaluable tool for fact-checking and holding people accountable. We got this phone call from someone at Google who um, asked if we had seen what uh, Donald Trump had just tweeted. And he had tweeted out a, a video making the argument that Google hadn't promoted the State of the Union address this year as they had um, under um, Obama. And so Google asked if we had a copy of the front page. But right? they don't have a record of that. Yeah, that's not their job necessarily, right. But it is a job for the Wayback Machine. It was a request and, and a need to try to, to try to set the record straight. And we did, and it was in fact being promoted. But having a permanent record of everything could have some unintended consequences. I think people will get a pass for some things, but I think they'll be held accountable for other aspects of their digital lives. So to you, those trade-offs are worth it? I think we're all adjusting to a digital world. Okay, everybody, here are some of today's headlines briefly. Two U.S. warplanes carrying seven Marines collided in mid-air off the coast of Japan early Thursday morning. One of the two rescued Marines has died and five remain missing. The crash is the latest in a series of accidents involving the U.S. military in Japan. The U.S. ambassador issued a statement reiterating the importance of America's mission there. He said that Marines, quote, risk their lives every day to protect Japan and protect this region, and sometimes they pay the greatest cost. I want to emphasize the security alliance that we have is critical, and it is moving forward in a very positive direction. All right, switching gears now, guys. On Friday, we're expecting to see three major documents from Mueller and federal prosecutors. First, sentencing memos will be filed in the cases against Michael Cohen, President Trump's former personal attorney and confidant. Cohen has been working with the government, and Friday's documents are expected to detail what and how much Cohen has told prosecutors about his former boss's dealings. Also, last week, prosecutors yanked Paul Manafort's plea deal because of alleged crimes and lies that violated their agreement. So on Friday, Mueller's team is expected to file a document spelling out exactly what the former Trump campaign chief did to break the terms of their deal. Now, people who watch these investigations closely say the public might not actually learn that much from these filings because large sections could look like this, redacted, just like we saw on Michael Flynn's court docs earlier this week. Okay, moving on now to Fortnite. Season 7 is out now, and as players are deep into their games, submerged in winter, Epic Games is being hit with a lawsuit. Brooklyn rapper 2 Millie is suing the company, alleging misappropriation, use, and sale of the Millie Rock dance. Remember that one made famous in a 2014 music video? Well, Fortnite's version is called Swipe It, and when you watch the two back to back, it's hard to deny the similarities, and no, I am not going to demonstrate, okay? This is not the first time the game has been called out for its sale of emotes, many of which are dances, without giving credit to the originator of the move. So Chance the Rapper called the company out on Twitter saying, and I'm paraphrasing a bit here, Fortnite should pay the black creatives behind the dance moves in the game. All right, now let's talk colors, shall we? Ultraviolet is so last year, okay? 2019 is all about a bright orangey hue found deep in the ocean. Pantone has crowned Living Coral the color of the year for 2019. The self-proclaimed global authority on color says, the vibrant yet mellow color embraces us with warmth and nourishment to provide comfort in our continually shifting environment. Wow, I've never thought about coral that way before. The choice seems to be a nod to climate change though, right? I mean, Pantone's yearly selection has a big influence over products and pur purchasing decisions across a host of industries. And those are your headlines, briefly. We'll be right back in 30 seconds. This grave constitutional crisis thing. The people in the room, they gasped. It then became clear what this was about. That's really, to use a legal expression, that's when the <laughs> hit the fan. This is a story that is not well known. What stuck in my mind about it was this was in the White House. And the fact of the matter was, he was a crook. Oh my God. But it really should be, especially maybe now. Rachel Maddow and MSNBC present Bagman. Binge all seven episodes now. You know what's really rare these days? 
finding out that politicians are working together to achieve a common goal. And it's even more crazy when that common goal is prison reform. So when I heard this criminal justice bill, the First Step Act, was moving through Congress with bipartisan support, I was like, uh, y'all feeling okay? The bipartisan bill before us is a meaningful, historic criminal justice reform measure. I supported this bipartisan bill in committee because it will help more ex-offenders re-enter the workforce. We have went to so many different groups from the left and the right that say this is a great first step. So I urge a yes vote, and I do so with a lot of enthusiasm today. So here's what the First Step Act hopes to do. It would ease sentencing for low-level drug offenders, reduce prison overcrowding, and encourage rehabilitation programs to help people re-enter society. So Jared Kushner was actually one of the earliest backers of the First Step Act, plus evangelical groups, the ACLU, right-wing mega-donors, the Koch brothers, even private prison giants like GEO and CCA support the strategies outlined in this legislation. Now, a bipartisan victory like this would be huge for President Trump. And he says he's all for it. Today, I'm thrilled to announce my support for this bipartisan bill that will make our community safer and give former inmates a second chance at life after they have served their time. But of course, this is, this is all too good to be true, right? It can't be this easy. It literally is just a first step, this piece of legislation. So you've got a handful of Democrats who say it doesn't go far enough, and some Republicans who say it goes too far. Now, the First Step Act passed through the Republican-controlled House earlier this year, so now it's the Senate's turn to do something, and leader Mitch McConnell is stalling. The majority of the Republican caucus is behind this thing, but there are a few hardcore haters like Republican Senator Tom Cotton from Arkansas. This is how he describes the First Step Act. A sentencing leniency bill that will let thousands of violent, serious, and repeat felons out of prison within just weeks or months of its passing. But look, I mean, is anyone surprised? I mean, he's been putting the hard in hardliner since 2014. This is the same guy who said we have an under-incarceration problem in America. As for the claim that we should have more empathy for criminals, I won't even try to conceal my contempt for this idea. I empathize first and foremost with the victims of crime and their families. We ought to give criminals a shot at rehabilitation and redemption, but primarily because it's in our interest as a society, not because they deserve more empathy. Look, Senator Cotton, most of the First Step Act applies to nonviolent drug offenders, and wardens would still have to give their approval for early release into a halfway house. Word on the street, Cotton's trying to sway key swing votes like Ted Cruz. But interestingly enough, the same people who worked on prison reform in Ted Cruz's state helped shape the First Step Act. In 2007, Texas lawmakers realized just how expensive it was to house 170,000 prisoners. Through reform policies, Texas reduced the incarcerated population by 12,000 and closed eight prisons. I mean, this likely saved Texas about $2.5 billion. Oh, and by the way, the crime rate there is the lowest it's been since 1967. So how did a red law and order state like Texas become the model for federal criminal justice reform? Well, some like to think legislators come for the savings and stay for the salvation. Meanwhile, in Washington, doesn't seem like McConnell is interested in either of those things. He has enough time and enough support to bring the first step back to the Senate floor for a vote. Advocates of this legislation believe the last couple of weeks left in this session of Congress might be the best opportunity we have as a nation to make a modest dent in criminal justice reform for the next few years. And if this inaction continues, generations of American families will suffer over a few petty partisan political points. All right, this week, the nation said goodbye to former President George H.W. Bush, who passed away at the age of 94. In an exclusive interview, the Today Show sat down with the elder statesman's granddaughters, who shared memories of the man they called Gampy. Take a look. We miss him already very much, because he really was the center of our family. And yet, I think I also get a lot of joy knowing that he's with our grandmother now. He um, 
missed her dreadfully after she died and wanted to spend the summer in Maine, so I know that was motivating to him. And now they can spend Christmas together. Just his last months and going back to Maine, what did that mean to you and your family mm -hmm. to spend these final days and weeks and months with him? I mean, I, we didn't take it for granted because he, we knew we most likely this was going to be his last summer, and we all knew that. And so we took communion with him on Sundays. And one of my favorite memories were my little girls singing Jesus Loves Me and watching my grandpa sing it. Um, it was beautiful, that contrast between the old and the young. And every day, Mila and Poppy would say, let's go give Great Gampy a hug. And he'd be sitting in his lazy boy watching some cops or something <laughs> on television, <laughs> Law and Order. And they would go and just hug him and love on him. And I think we didn't take that moment for granted because we knew that he probably didn't want to live that much longer without my grandma. And finally tonight, here's one thing you might not know about George Bush Sr. The late president was a self-described sock man. Esquire's Jay Fielden stopped by to tell us about Bush's signature sock collection. Yeah, I'm Jay Fielden. I'm the editor-in-chief of Esquire magazine. I think what socks say about George Bush is that he really did have a personality. And in thinking about him particularly, I think they say different things about him at different times in his life um, when he was vice president and then a little later when he became president, he was a guy who liked to wear colorful socks. I think that, you know, made him that kind of guy that we all know that's, that would otherwise be probably very intimidating and hard to approach. The socks were the one thing where you could see that sense of humor that he had and the desire that he had to kind of uh, not just be a stiff in a suit who was running the country and the free world. As he got older, he could do that thing that only kind of admired uh, uh, grandfathers can do, right? He told his granddaughter, I am a sock man. I think that's a direct quote. Once he was uh, de debilitated to the point where he had to be in a wheelchair, he started taking particular interest in the message that his socks would give to the world. And he did certain things with the socks, whether it was on election day wearing socks that said, go vote, on days that certain football teams that he followed or baseball teams that he followed played wearing those socks. So I, I think that that was just part of like revealing more about who he was than than he could ever have done before. I mean, we all know about how secret he was, and, and here was a little bit of a thing that, that, that was revealing something about his personal life and his personal taste. I think that's maybe why some, so many people have noticed this. What he was trying to say was some of the socks that he wore also had a political message. I'm thinking particularly of the time that he wore the socks with Clinton's face, and um, I think one could interpret that as an, an expression of the possibility, the belief that men from two very different platforms, agendas, um, legacies, all those things can still become great friends. Presidential fashion is a fascinating thing. We've gotten to a point where I think the expression of the presidency is one of the managerial class. And I think it's because we place, especially at this moment in time, so much interest in class and background and privilege. So you can't look like um, your clothes say you went to some place that no one else could go or come from a family that had more money than anyone else. I think you just have to look presentable in a kind of um, global uh, dark suit, white shirt way, right? When you see the G20, almost every one of them look like they got the same exact suit handed to them that morning to put on. Who has the better sock collection, you or George H.W. Bush? I do, for, by far. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I have more than one drawer, and I'm talking about a big, deep drawer. And there are no silly motifs on them. OK, now I feel pressured to step up my sock game. It's so lame. Look at that. I don't even have socks. Embarrassing. All right, that's our show for tonight, guys. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.